Mark chapter 15 and verse number 1. The Gospel of Mark chapter number 15 and verse number 1. The infallible text says, And straightway in the morning the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at that feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had, had delivered him for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him, whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to make, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together, and they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it about his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, and put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. And they compelled one Simon a Cyrenian, who passing by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him into the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled, mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. Reading verses 1 through 26, Mark chapter number 15, the gospel according to St. Mark. The 15th chapter of Mark moves very quickly. Matthew records the same event, so does Luke. They tell us in detail the events that took place that day when mankind perpetrated his most heinous deed. The Son of the living God, the perfect Son of God, no guile ever found in his mouth, the one whose every word was the Word of God, whose every thought was the thought of God, whose every deed was pure, whose every motive was pure. This man who walked on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, healed the sick, raised the dead, and my friend had healed the leper. This man who had never done a wrong thing in his life, had come to the ultimate place of man's hatred for God, showing God and showing man what they think of his son. They took him to a tree and they nailed him on that cross. If Jesus Christ were to appear in this world today and make himself vulnerable to men as he did then, they'd do the same thing. Make no mistake about it. They'd take him to a tree. There they'd nail him on the cross. But I'm so glad tonight, I'm so thankful tonight that the death of this man 2,000 years ago was not the death of a martyr, not just one more death of the hundreds of millions who have died and fallen prey at the hands of murderers and so forth. No, sir. The death of this man 2,000 years ago was the death of God's Son foreordained before the foundation of the world that He would die for my sins and your sins. No, my friend, it was not a mistake. He is not a martyr. He didn't simply fall prey to man, but this was the death of all deaths because this death finished all death. This was where the death of all deaths 
were wrapped up in the death of Jesus Christ. For in his death, all death gave an account. In his death, all death was answered. And in his death, all the pains of death were wrapped up in one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, if he had stayed dead, dead would have, death would have won. If he had stayed dead, death would have been victor. And we would be sitting here tonight and our loved, ones would, our loved ones would be dead and we would have no hope. We would be like so many people are tonight, drinking their troubles away, they think. And with no hope and my friend no future, don't you suppose a man ought to act like an animal? If they teach him he evolved from a slug, they tell him he's no better than a rat or a dog, then does it surprise you that he acts that way? But I thank God tonight that this death is the death of a man that loved me, a man that died for me. When you look at the cross of Calvary tonight, I want you to be very careful. What do you see? Do you see a historic event that took place 2,000 years ago where a man died and he died at the hands of the Jews? And if you had been there, you would have done something to change it. Or 2,000 years ago, when you look at the death of Jesus Christ, do you see the love of God and the foreordained plan that he would die for your sins? That's what I see. For if I had been there that day 2,000 years ago, my friend, I would have been just as guilty of all the rest of them of crucifying the Son of God. The Apostle Paul in his ministry years later began to preach this cross. And he said in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto us who are saved, my friend, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This cross separates. This cross makes a difference. This message that I'm preaching to you tonight of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ destroys religion in its very tracks. It does away with the good works of man. The cross of Jesus Christ makes you answer to God. What are we going to do with the crucified Son of God? They stood that day and wagged their heads. They spat upon him. They reviled him. They did everything that a human could do to God's blessed Son. And I'm amazed. I'm always amazed at the powerful, almighty Son of God with the ability to wipe us into hellfire. And yet on that cross, he took all the shame. He let it all come upon his soul, and he bore it and didn't say a word. I think about the love of God in sending his son to die for me and for you. Somebody said, preacher, nobody ever loved me. You've never read the story of the cross and said that. You can't read the New Testament and say that nobody loves you. If you read that New Testament, you come away with a distinct impression. Yes, sir, there's one that loves me, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the lover of my soul. Do you know that to be a fact? I thank God tonight for that fact. The apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse number 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The apostle Paul was capable of arguing with any philosopher, the Epicureans and the Stoics and all of their ilk, but the apostle argued not a word. He said, I am coming with the power of God, and the power of God is the cross of Jesus Christ. That, my friend, is the only thing that can set us in a free. I brought you a message this morning with my heart and soul to do the best I can to show you how that you're in the bondage of sin. You're bound in it, you're born in it, you live in it, and you'll die in it. But the Lord Jesus Christ, thanks be unto God, can deliver the sinner from the bondage of sin. The Son of God died that we could live. He was crucified and put to death to show God's love for me. So therefore, when Paul stood up in the midst of sinners going to hell, men and women of the bondage of sin, when he stood before the pagans, accustomed to offering his sexual sacrifices to his gods and goddesses. What did Paul preach to the church at Corinth, which was one of the most corrupt outfits on this earth? He didn't come with philosophy and vain words. The apostle came with the power of God. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That, my friend, is the book that's the blessed hope, and that'll set you free. It is the power of God tonight unto salvation. And there's only one thing that can do it. It is the cross of Jesus Christ. 
Notice again, I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Well, did Paul continue to crucify Him? Did He keep Him on the cross? Was the message of the Apostle Paul a continual mass, re-sacrificing and re-offering Jesus Christ? No. Paul probably wrote the book of Hebrews and he said that he has been crucified one time and forever. The preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ then doesn't mean that I'm preaching Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm preaching that Jesus Christ was on the cross and was taken and laid in a tomb and thanks be unto God on the third day ascended to the right hand of heaven. That is the message of the cross. Jesus Christ is victor over death, hell, and the grave. The apostle says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. If my Lord Jesus Christ had thought of himself, he could not have died. For he had to give his life. They could not take it. For six agonizing hours he hung on the tree. For six hours he suffered indignation. For six hours, my friend, there the ridicule of man I'm going to tell you right now, that did not kill him. And the cross did not kill him. And the nails in his hands did not kill him. And the Roman spear in his side did not kill him. What did, preacher? A broken heart for you and me. Father, it is finished. I've done it. I've satisfied your demands. A holy, righteous God judging sin that I have become said enough is enough and he paid it in full on the cross that day he took a stamp and said paid in full thanks be unto God he took another stamp and said charge it to his account and that goes on mine thank God today you better believe the preaching of the cross was the message of Paul he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. These people who think that they have to add human intellect, human quips, little trite, smart, cute sayings to give credence and power to the Word of God are sadly mistaken. If that blessed book is preached in its purity and its beauty, it'll save the sinner. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved. Are you listening? Are you listening? The cross is to the man that's going to hell foolishness. How can a dead Jew help me, he says? How can a man who wound up a victim, a martyr of his own theology, a radical, a rebel, as they call him. How can he do me any good? Well, if he's still on the cross, he can't do you any good. But he's not on the tree. The apostle says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But listen carefully. Listen. But unto us, which are saved. It is the power of God. Do you want God's power in your life? Do you really want the hand of God on your life? Then plug into the cross. Learn the lesson of the cross. Get a hold of it. Begin to see it for what it is. The cross of Jesus Christ is total sacrifice. It is absolute surrender. It is God and nothing else. The cross of Jesus Christ is a man that said, here's my life. I lay it down. Oh, tonight, that we would get the lesson. Our life is not what we make of it. It's what he makes of it. But you've got to give it to him to let him do it. Amen. The apostle says in Galatians 5 and verse 11, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense 
of the cross ceased. What do you mean? I mean that when I tell a man that he's not good enough to go to heaven, it's going to make him mad. There are men in this country who have paid fortunes and belong to secret organizations and given their lives to it that honestly think that God is going to accept them one day and be pleased because of what they've done in this world. And the truth is that hell is going to open its mouth and swallow them up and they're going to burn forever. You say, preacher, is that the offense of the cross? You better believe it. The offense of the cross says, I don't care if you're a Baptist, if you're a Methodist, if you're a Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, whatever you are, your church isn't worth the powder and lead it takes to blow it to hell if it doesn't preach the cross. Jesus Christ said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men into me. Oh, the cross. When I begin to examine my life in light of the cross, it drives me to my knees. It makes me pray like nothing else makes me pray. When I read the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, and I read about what happened to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at the hands of sinners, when I realize how vulnerable he made himself so that I could be saved, when I realize what he allowed himself to be put through so you could be saved, it drives me to my face and it said, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift, the gift of his son. But how many of us really mean what we say when we talk about the cross? The apostle says in Ephesians 2.16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Listen carefully. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. This is important. If one man ever lived on this earth that took the cross that Jesus Christ died on, took it and developed it into a whole system of theology, it was Paul. If ever a man lived that took the cross that Jesus Christ died on and went beyond the physical death, into the real application and meaning of what it is to everybody, what it is to God, what it is to man, what it is in hell. It's Paul. He took the cross. He broke it down. He developed its elements. And he began to preach the cross of Christ. He said, the apostle, in Galatians chapter number 3, in verse 1, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? You say, well, how could that be? Very simple. Paul preached Christ and him crucified. Paul preached the gospel, the good news. That tonight, sinners, what you need. You don't need a revamping you don't need a working over. You sure don't need a bunch of psycho babble. What you need tonight is the plain, simple cross and the blood applied, your sins washed away, and the burden lifted. And you become a new creature in Christ Jesus the Lord. I'm amazed at how many Baptist preachers today have stopped preaching the new birth. Watch them. Watch them. You'd be amazed. You say, well, preacher, they're still preaching the gospel. They're preaching a form of a gospel. But you watch them carefully. The new birth is what separates us from religion. The new birth is what separates you from your righteousness. The new birth is what separates you from God. For until you are born again, you're a child of the devil. And once you're born again, you become a child of God. The apostle said in Galatians 2.20, once again he appeals to the cross and watch his reasoning. In Galatians 2.20 he said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Well now Paul physically did not die on the cross when the Lord Jesus Christ did. But Paul theoretically 
and theologically and practically he did die when Jesus Christ died the Son of God bless his name took all of his children to that tree that day and he said death let's take your best shot go ahead let it fly and death turned loose with everything it had I'll tell you right now he took all of his children into his wing put them in his death when he died I died with him you can't kill a dead man but one time you can't kill him again and now with all of his children in him on the third day he looked death square in the face and said get out of the way hell and death has been set free up I come and the gates of hell couldn't hold him, for he came out with the keys of death and hell. Death couldn't hold him. So the apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, Oh, death, where is thy victory? Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Now, since you've already died, and it's already been settled, and the apostle Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, then what are you worried about? Well, preacher, I just don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to die one day. No, you're not. If you're born again, you're not. That's settled. It's just take off the tent, lay it down, and let's go home. That's what it's going to be. It'll be the most glorious day since the day God saved your soul. Strike the tent. Let me go. Turn me loose. And never look back. And the way you go, that's what death holds for the Christian. It's just an exit, exodus, from planet Earth into a land that is fairer than day. And by faith I shall see it afar. Yes, my love is laid up on the other side, folks. That's where you set your affections, on things above. It's the apostle that begins to develop the doctrine of the cross then. See? See how simple this is? He takes the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and develops into a theological doctrine with all of its implications and applications it is left to the Apostle Paul and I can't exhaust it tonight not in one sermon I can only reach in there and pull out some of the great truths that are so blessed and so wonderful isn't that wonderful isn't it wonderful oh isn't it wonderful you don't have to fear death for death has no power over you you can't kill a man but once and my friend, it's already done. And now it has another application when you look at this. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. What's that mean? I'm identified with him. If I died with him, I'm part of him. If you hate Christ, you hate me. And the converse. If you're one of God's children and they hate you, they hate Christ. The apostle Paul learned that lesson well when he persecuted the church of God in Jerusalem. And having letters going to Damascus to persecute more and throw them in jail and put them to death, he came face to face with the Lord of glory. And what did the Son of God say to him? What's it say in your Bible? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Keep your hands off God's children. Amen. Keep your hands off of them. Because if you lay your hand on one of God's little ones, he said it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and cast into the midst of the sea. And we belong to the Lord tonight. Are you one of His? Oh, the cross. For six hours He hung, bled, suffered indignation, and then gave up the ghost. The death angel didn't come by and smite Him and take His soul. The powers of hell that hovered over Him didn't win out on their last battle. One unrelenting blow after another, and then the Lord Jesus couldn't take any more, and he finally yielded to the powers of hell and death. No, that's not your Bible. On the sixth hour, in full knowledge of who he was and what he was doing, he looked into the gates of heaven, into the mercy seat, there to Almighty God, in the light which no man can approach into, which no man hath seen. He looked into the face of that light, and he said, My God, my God, my God, why, why did you forsake me? And then for the next six hours, it settled upon his soul that he had become the propitiation for our sins, 
the sacrifice and peace offering, the meal offering, the drink offering, all of those Old Testament offerings to appease an angry God. He became all of that. And there upon the tree, having gone through all that he could go through, he suffered every blow that came from heaven. That's where the blows were coming from. It was those darts of glory. A holy God sending his anger down. One blow right after another. There's a filthy fornicator he strikes. There's an adult one lying murder he strikes. A drunken thief he strikes. The anger of a holy God pounding and pounding and pounding. And those blows being received upon that tree into the heart and soul of the Son of Man. For it wasn't his son he saw hanging on that tree. It was the substitutionary sacrificial lamb he saw hanging on that tree. He saw the one on that cross. John the Baptist years before had said, Remember, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And make no mistake about it, my old, dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, stinking sins were part of what he carried away. And God sent that final blow, that last rage of glory, that last venting of anger of a holy God down. I dare believe with all of my soul that if God Almighty had done to a man what he did to him, he would have pulverized him long ago. The first blow to fall from heaven would have whacked him straight into hell fire itself. There's not a man on the face of this earth that could take a blow from a holy God coming in judgment and glory. But this is man's day. This is the day of man. He said it is. He said this is your day and your hour and the power of darkness. Oh, that's a great thought. Oh, friend of mine, when I say this is your hour, the power of darkness, and the Lord Jesus looked at men and he said, you're taking me in the Garden of Gethsemane and you're going to carry me down here and you're going to nail me on a tree. This is your power. This is your hour. This is the hour of darkness. This is the power of man. But you hear me well. The day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. And the day of man is setting. The day of the Lord is rising. And the day of man is going down. What's the day of the Lord, preacher? The day of the Lord is when the Lord God Almighty, King of kings and Lord of lords, that man of war with a full-drawn sword, two-edged sword, will come again. And this time not has the Galilean carpenter's son, vulnerable to death. This time he comes taking heads off, blood flowing high as a horse's bridle. He comes and there's no mercy extended, no mercy given. He comes to judge the quick, the living, and the dead. Who is that preacher? That's the same one that I'm standing preaching for tonight. That's the one I prayed to today. That's the one they nailed on this cross. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, it's the day of man. You want to know why hell seems to have no boundaries? You want to know why wicked men seem to prosper like they never have? It's the day of man. This is not the kingdom of God. The world's not getting better. It's one some poor, disillusioned maniac a few years ago penned a song that said, it's a great, big, wonderful world. I wish that he'd go to the hospitals with me tomorrow. I'd like for him to go out in the calls at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. I'd like for him to go down the graveyard with me. I'd like for him to stand there and watch him lower the casket beneath the sod. I'd like for him to look in the faces of babies crying because their mama's not home. I'd like him to look in the face of reality in the real world. No, man, it's not a great, big, wonderful world. This is a floating graveyard in the sky. It's a hell hole. It's under a curse. It's going to hell. But there's a few jewels in here he's going to pluck out first. Amen. And I thank God I'm one of them. Man's day, this is man's ultimate expression of rebellion against God. Listen carefully. Earlier in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ gave a parable to the religious. Here's what he said to them. They will reverence my son. This is the heir, they said. Come, let us kill him. Let us seize on his inheritance. That's what they said. This is the son. This is the heir. Let us seize on his inheritance. This is man's expression, his ultimate expression of rebellion against God. 
Listen carefully. If a man will take the pure, holy Son of God and nail him to a tree, he will do anything to you. Secondly, the Son's ultimate expression of his love for us. I can't find anything anywhere that could tell me God loves me anymore than when the Lord Jesus Christ opened his hands and shed his blood for me. And then last of all, it's God's judgment on sin seen in three ways. Number one, the severity of sin is illustrated by his death. It's not a game. It's not a game with God. It took the death of a pure man, the holy, righteous Son of God, to pay for your wicked sins. And you have the gall to think you can pay for them. And you have the gall to think you can do anything to expiate them. You have the gall to think that religion can do anything to do away with the penalty of sin. No, only the Son of God. Secondly, it shows the helplessness of the sinner shown by the thief on the cross and those standing nearby. You couldn't have done one thing to change the circumstances that day. We are helpless. We are lost and we are going to hell without the Lord Jesus Christ. And last of all, it shows the righteousness of God in sending His Son to die on the cross to keep us out of hell. It settled the issue of hell. God can be a righteous God and burn you forever because He sent His Son to die to give you eternal life. And God has, got, has done everything that can be done to save the sinner's soul. Our simple response tonight, I ask it from any of you, it's a simple response. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. And ye shall find rest for your souls. Come to the woman at the well and drink of the water of life freely. Come, John says, and eat the bread of life. Come, the apostle says, and hear the words of life. I'm offering life tonight. The devil only can give you death. Well, I'll die one day, preacher, if I don't know Jesus. No, you're dead already. You're a walking corpse. You live in death. You'll forever be dead. And one day you'll go to the second death. And there suffer in hell forever. Oh God, use what I've said tonight. I've delivered my soul. Thank you, Lord, for the message. Father, these dear people in this building that have listened graciously to me tonight, must make a decision. They must respond. I'm sure that many of them here tonight have total peace in their heart, and they should because they're born again, and they rejoice in what your son did, and I rejoice with them. But our Father, there'll be some in here tonight who don't have that. They're not saved. They're playing church. They're playing religion. They're playing morality. You're the only one who knows what they're playing. They may not even know what they're playing, but it's for sure they're not saved. God, in Jesus' name, convict the sinner and draw them to the cross. Oh, the cross of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. In Jesus' name we pray.